Welcome to Silicon Valley Successes. On today's show, we have Nathan Gold. The Wall Street Journal called him an elevator pitch expert. He's an industry fellow at UC Berkeley and Hong Kong Baptist University and a guest lecturer at Wharton Entrepreneurship. He's featured on the Kauffman Founders School and is a published author. Nathan travels the world coaching star entrepreneurs for high stakes speaking opportunities. And you're about to meet him in a moment. Nathan, welcome to Silicon Valley Successes. Thank you for having me. Now, Nathan, there's some exciting news I hear. I hear you're coming out with your second book. Could you tell us about it? I'd be delighted to. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. It's really about 11 years in the making, and it's sort of a confluence of events. What I mean by that is when I go out to coach entrepreneurs or anyone that has a speaking opportunity, we're all faced with nervousness. Every one of us are faced with nervousness. It's just to what degree do we have it, and then what do we do with it? So at the end of all my talks, all my workshops, any coaching sessions, before people go up on stage, they would always say, so what do I do about my nerves? And I would give them the three things, which well, is... What are the three things? Okay, I'll give you the three things right now, which is you need to warm up your voice. Most people, they're real quiet. They don't do anything with their voice before a really important presentation, they get up there and they expect their voice to just act like it's been really warmed up. Just like a sport, you need to warm this part of your body up. Now, is there a way to warm it up? Are you yeah. just drink hot water? No, or? you just go outside and hum, sing, do your first line or two about 10 times just to speak aloud. Humming works, singing. Uh, you don't want to hear me sing. <laughs> the second thing is you need to breathe. You need to remind yourself to breathe because whenever you're nervous, our breathing typically changes when we're stressed or nervous. So breathing is probably the number one thing you need to do. Is there a certain way to breathe through our nose, our mouth, or big mouth, closed mouth? Is there a technique to that? It depends on the severity of that anxiety or nervousness that you feel. The most important thing I can tell you and all the viewers is you just need to breathe more and deeper, like down into the abdominal area. Because if you were nervous, like you didn't know you were nervous, I mean, you didn't know your body was reacting this way, you'd probably be breathing like this. Oh, just around the chest area high and up, the shoulders. High up, and in fact, sometimes you get so stressed, you actually stop breathing until your body says, oh, ah, you've had this experience, we've all had this experience, it just depends on the, the, the amount of anxiety that you're feeling. So then the third thing before we move on so we don't mess around with your viewers, the third thing is really the magic. Besides breathing and giving your body the oxygen just like I did, I took a much deeper breath so I have more energy now that I can use to talk to you. But the third thing is in my head right now I'm playing music and while you were announcing this talk I played some music in my head. In psychology it's called a mood inducer. It actually induces a mood in me, and it induces a mood in all of us when you just play the right piece of music. Now, you don't want to play a loving piece of music. In my head, I was playing the Rocky theme, kind of going to fly now. When I play that music, I just sit differently, I act differently, I talk differently, and that's my theme music for getting me into the right state of mind. So then my butterflies are all flying in formation, whereas everybody else's might be just flying all over the place. So warming up. Breathing and music was all I would tell people to do for years in the last five minutes. But over the last two to three years, I've been spending much more time with people, helping them really deal with speaking anxiety. Because when you walk up on the TED stage or a TEDx stage, can you imagine walking up on the TED stage right now in Vancouver? Right in front of you is Bill Gates, Warren Buffett. Al Gore and a bunch of other billionaires, and you have 
three minutes to do your thing. I had a client like that. That'd be an amazing experience. Oh, man, it was awesome. I didn't do it, but he went up there and he did his three minutes. And actually, you want to hear the story? It's yeah. an amazing story. He was prepared for everything. His name was Evan Tan, and you can look it up on the TED properties. He had three minutes. He walks up. He starts into his three minutes. About a minute, ten into it, the microphone cuts out, which is unheard of at a TED. Like, this is the TED event, mm. and we prepared for it. We prepared for the mic cuts out. If the tech goes down, you just keep moving. And he just stepped out, kept talking, plowed through. About ten seconds later, the mic came back on, and he finished out his talk. So what happened was, true story, it can be verified. He's in backstage. He calls me. He tells me what happened. He hangs up. He goes out from behind stage. In the break, Bill Gates walks up to him and says, that was a great job. Pros never blame, blame I'm sorry, he said, professionals never blame the tech, do they? And asked him for a business card and wanted to know more about what he did. So, you know, sometimes I get these people that are trying for perfection, for segue. Perfection is not what you really want. You just want to do excellent work out there. So, this book is all about handling speaking anxiety from anything like a TED Talk to a keynote to a peer presentation at a company all the way through to a job interview. Or maybe you're being interviewed like this. I had anxiety when I was coming over here. Maybe you had a little anxiety when you stood up in front of the camera and it said, ready, set. You feel it, but, but you learn to use it in a way that empowers you. And that's what the book is all about. There are 18 tools that you can literally start using to harness your speaking anxiety. And then part two is 10 tools that you can start using to connect emotionally with your audience. So when you're connecting emotionally with your audience, that interaction, how much more valuable is it when you get to that level? Any time a speaker connects emotionally with their audience is a really good thing. You can do so much more with your message when you connect emotionally with an audience. And there's so many ways you can do it, so many. But the speaking anxiety has to be handled first. You can't just walk in there and do a trick on your audience to connect with them emotionally and tell a tearful story, although people do that all the time. Mm -hmm. There's more to it than that. But it's handling that anxiety so that you can turn those butterflies into your authentic self, which leads you into the ability to be more persuasive and be able to connect with people on an, a heart level or an emotional level. So Nathan, before asking you about all your current work with startups and executives around the world, I'd like to find out, how did you get into this field of being a presentation coach, helping people get on these TED Talks on stage and having them wow Bill Gates? You know, when I, I left school early, I was doing a degree in computer science, and I went into training. I just wanted to start making money, so I started training, and then I worked for software and hardware companies my whole career doing product demos. I love to take anything, hardware, software, and I could go out with the salespeople. They would knock on the doors. We'd go in. I would do the demo, and then they would ask for the order. I loved doing demos. And so I absorbed every book out there that I could get my hands on, every course that I could go on on about how to be a better presenter. And I used all of the things I learned to become the best possible demo jockey out there. I just wanted to just do the best. And I learned all those skills by being the subject matter expert. I was never asking for the order. So it, it was a bit of a different persuasive kind of a pitch presentation. I just had to demo the product. Then the salespeople would ask for the order. So that was a long career. And then I turned 50. I had gotten laid off three times. And on the third time, you know, in Silicon Valley, you can get laid off any time, right? Oh, it could be hourly. Yeah, and it's not my fault, of course. <laughs> never your fault. Anyway, I was 50. Honestly, Sean and I decided I just never wanted to get laid off again. You want to talk about anxiety? Not speaking anxiety, getting laid off, that causes anxiety. And I thought, what, well, what do you do if you're going to be never responsible or held to somebody else? You have to be your own boss. Mm -hmm. So I thought, what could I do that 
I love doing. Well, I love presenting. So I wrote the book called, or I love demoing. So I wrote a book called Giving Memorable Product Demos. I published it. It's on Amazon.com. And it didn't sell that well because there were too many competitors out there. And it didn't pay that well. So then I met my first entrepreneur at DLA Piper, right in Silicon Valley here. And they asked me if I could help them raise money. And it was just a different variation of trying to be persuasive. One thing led to another. And here we are 11 years later, thousands of entrepreneurs, lots and lots of money raised. And what was your original question? Oh, God. <laughs> I got captured in the okay. story, but it was just how did you get into Oh, how did I get? Field? Yes. So I really just held out my shield and said, I'm a, I'm a coach. And for about a year, I had very little credibility. Now, the only credibility I really did have was, honestly, I have two Demo God Awards. Believe it or not, there was a conference years ago before TechCrunch came along called Demo. And they used to give out Demo God Awards. So out of about 60, 70 presenters, they'd give five, 10 awards out for the best of the best. I have two of those. Those are very coveted. It's not like a Grammy, but it was at, for its time. So I used that as a way to kind of entice people to try me out. But I literally went about 18 months without really charging people any money. But the deal was pay for performance. If I get help you get a second meeting or I help you raise your money, I have to be able to talk about you and you have to be able to pick up the phone with my next client. So I used my initial 12-ish months to build those war stories. And once I had three war stories, like real ones that I could point to, that was enough for every client afterwards to say, okay, I'll try you. Okay, I'll do it. Once I had one incubator, one university, the Coffin Foundation, once I had all of those things, and the Wall Street Journal, of course, that helped a lot. Well, to everyone, <laughs> tell us about the Wall Street Journal. That was one of those serendipitous experiences. I got a call, and they said, Nathan, we got your name. Uh, we have five presenters that are doing a uh, a one-minute pitch in the elevator, and we need a pitch coach to come in and coach them after they've pitched. It was this contest called the Wall Street Journal, uh, Startup of the Year. OK, fine. So I pack my bags, and I you know, bring a suit, because I figure, you know, TV, Wall Street Journal. I show up on Friday night, and they walk us in on Saturday, and I show up at the director. Everybody's in jeans and t-shirts, and I'm thinking, what's going on here? And I'm in a tie and I'm looking like a million bucks and the director and I are sitting there talking he says why are you all dressed up I said well because I thought I was going to be filmed he says oh no 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 we we're just going to do a voiceover but now that you're here hmm you look pretty good you want to be on camera and I thought is this a trick question be on camera and the Wall Street Journal uh okay and so for five days so Here's how it worked. They filmed me waiting in the lobby for the first entrepreneurs. They'd walk in. We'd both walk in the elevator. The doors would close. They would do their pitch. The doors would open 60 seconds later. They would leave. We did that for all five. Originally, we were going to go all the way up and down, but it was too noisy. So after that, then I sat down and coached each of those teams over the table just like I'm talking to you and gave them suggestions on how to improve, what to change, what I liked, what I didn't like. And then an hour later, we did it again. And some got better. Some actually got worse. It happens. If you don't have time to assimilate some suggestions, like we, we came with this beautiful analogy with this one company that was struggling with an analogy to help people understand the value of their product. And and he came up with the most brilliant one during our coaching, but when he got back in the elevator, he forgot it. You know, just that fast. That's what speaking anxiety can do. Anyway, moral of the story is five days in a row, every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, each one of those teams with my videos, my speaking was on the front page of the WSJ.com in the business section for that whole week. My SEO just went like this. <laughs> Who's this guy, Nathan Gold, at the Wall Street Journal? I was a nobody. I'm still a nobody. But back then, I was really a nobody. <laughs> so for more stories about Nathan Gold and our other guest here on Silicon Valley Successes, please visit our website at siliconvalleysuccesses.com. Visit us on our Facebook, LinkedIn, and our other social media accounts. Now, Nathan, let's go back to how you help entrepreneurs. So if I'm an entrepreneur and I come to you, 
Mm -hmm. What does that first session look like, that onboard, and how would you work with me? After 11 years, it's very easy. Uh, it takes me about 10 minutes to decide whether or not I'm right for you because I only take really serious people these days. And I don't mean to be obnoxious about that, but there are some people that just need some coaching, and there's plenty of pitch coaches out there. There's plenty of videos out there to help you. But if you have, let's say you're going up in front of the band of angels, and there's 100 people in the audience, and you have seven minutes, you don't want to mess around with that, right? If you have something like that, OK. But these days, when somebody just comes and says, well, we're going to start our seed round. We're going to start our Series A. Yeah. I'm doing too many other things now with entrepreneurs, such as helping them get over their speaking anxiety so they can do better either in an investor pitch or in a customer pitch. So to your question, what do I do in the first session? The first session is always free. And either I do it remotely or I do it face to face if possible. And the reason I like to do it for free is because I like to prove value. There are too many consultants like me running around, blah, 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 and say, oh, if you just hire me, I'll tell you the rest of it. I like to spend the first half an hour with somebody providing the same type of coaching they would get if it was a real paid hour. And after half an hour, if they haven't decided that this guy can provide solid nourishment versus empty calories in these coaching sessions, then we're not right for each other. Also, I get a half an hour to decide if I want to work with that person. There is nothing worse as a coach than working with somebody that is not coachable. I can smell them a mile away. <laughs> Uncoachable people, I just, I have many uh, not good experiences with people. So like when that. you sit down with an entrepreneur, can you kind of gauge if that person will be successful or, I mean, coachable, not coachable, yes. But when you're listening to his idea, his presentation, can you tell if he's a leader, if he is someone that can manage people, if he has what it takes to get to that next level? I would say I do have a sixth sense feeling that when I do meet some of these people, that they have a better chance of success, partially because of the way they articulate their words and phrases, how they hold themselves, how they communicate, how they the nonverbal communication and their trustworthiness, how they build their credibility and all of that is is easy to spot for me these days because there's so much going on out there that you can spot the the normal entrepreneurs from the ones that really stand out. But I'll tell you this much, Sean, I can't pick the winners from the losers. I, I think of my role as a cheerleader. I think everything's going to work. I mean, if you told me this cup is the best cup on the planet and you proved to me that it was, I'd probably go tell other people it was too and see if we all agree. I feel like as a coach, I'm, I'm a cheerleader for an entrepreneur. I'm not an investor. I've never invested. I'm not an, an accredited investor. So I can't even invest money into a startup. But I wouldn't because I don't know how to pick them. I really don't. So I can tell who's a better presenter than another. I can tell you who has made much more progress than the others in terms of what's happened from session one to whenever we get to. Normally, I like to have three sessions, because the first session is normally about your content, your message, your slides, and what you're going to say. The second is normally taking all of that, and now you stand up and you actually do it, but not necessarily for real, real, like around the table on a TV show. And then the third session is when you stand up, we record you, and we sit down and watch it. We record you, sit down and watch it, and we take it apart piece by piece. So it's the words first, then the vocal, the word, and then the delivery. So I normally like three sessions at least. And those sessions can be as little as an hour, or they can stretch out to a couple, two or three hours. In an entrepreneur or a businessman's journey, is there any time that you would think that they've graduated, that they may no longer need a presentation coach? Yes. People reach a point where they outgrow their teacher. I have one client like that right now. But now we're friends. So I don't charge him anymore, and we're just friends. 
Why did they outgrow me? They have gotten to the point now where they're running on autopilot. They're so authentic. They've taken the four legs of credibility and they've built it so high that it's almost like they just need me as a director now. So I still come in and we'll review what they're planning. So do they need me? Yes, but not as much. You had mentioned the four legs of credibility. Oh. Can you go into detail of those four legs? I can, sure. Okay. Normally when it comes to credibility, people have their own definition of what it means to be credible. But in the startup world, and if you want to reduce your anxiety as a speaker, back to our original topic, you need to build your credibility and never stop building your credibility until the day you die. So for me, credibility has these four legs. The first one is the obvious one, which is an expertise or a specialty. You have to have some specialty or expertise to be able to right, have some credibility. Second is you need trustworthiness. You need to build trustworthiness because as an expert, that doesn't mean I trust you. So trustworthiness is something that you can build for the rest of your life. It's how you look. It's how you talk. It's what you wear. It's how you answer questions. It's how you shake somebody's hand. It's the total sum of who you are. Are you a trustworthy individual today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day? And when I see you in, uh, on the TV and when I see you in, writ, in, in the written word, are you trustworthy? Do you just continue to sound trustworthy or do you break that trust, right? Does your site look trustworthy? Does your LinkedIn look trustworthy? All of that builds trustworthiness. So you see how you can continue building that for the rest of your life and maintaining it. Third leg, because I know we don't have a lot of time. The third leg is to be in service to others, to be helpful. If you're doing your business for the right reasons, or you're doing whatever you're doing for the right reasons, which is to help others, to make this a better place to live, you'll add more to your credibility, much more. And it's not just for the money, right? So we have the first three. Should I quiz you? So the first three of the four layers of credibility, you have specialty right. in an area. Right. You have the complete package of trust. Beautiful. The third one was, was it credibility? No, it's the that's four the, legs that's of credibility. The, that's the, it's the in service to others. In service it's to, to be others. helpful. It's to be doing what you're doing for the right reasons. Like, I want to help you to help you get better. I don't want to help you so I can brag that I helped you. So that's the wrong reason. The right reason is to help you so that you get what you want out of life. Right? And if I get to brag later on, okay, great, that's a nice little sidebar. But, but doing it for the right reasons adds to your credibility. Okay, now the fourth. And this is the piece that usually is missing. Or people seem to leave it at home or in the car. And that is enthusiasm. When you pile enthusiasm on top of your expertise or specialty and being a totally trustworthy, believable person, on top of that, you really care you throw enthusiasm on top of that, you, you're a great speaker. You, you can persuade people in ways that you couldn't even imagine. Work on your credibility in those four areas, you become more persuasive literally overnight. Cheers. Wow. <laughs> so to go over everything we've talked about. Everything? We've talked about <laughs> your new book coming out. Yes. May 23rd, on, by the way. May 23rd. May 23rd. Part of it is getting people over that anxiety. You talked about three areas to do that. Yep. Breathing, about warming up the voice. And the third was Rocky. Having that theme song play in your That's head. Right. That's right. We've talked about working with entrepreneurs and how they need to be coachable and how you'll work with them three sessions normally. Mm -hmm. We also talked about the four pillars of credibility, enthusiasm doing it for the right reason, having expertise. And the fourth was Trust. trustworthiness. What am I missing that I need to know? That you need to know? Mm. I have 13 topics that I talk about. It's all about communications. I'm really excited about this book. I, I guess I would like you to know this. I'm not going about this book the way normal people go about it. I believe in pay it forward. Can I take a moment and explain that? Please. Okay. So my intent is to buy a bunch of books myself. Of course, at author pricing. 
I'm gonna sign every one of them and number them until I get to 1,000. I'm gonna hand out a book to anybody that wants one for free if they promise two things. One is if they like the book and they think it's valuable when they're done with it, either gift it to somebody or go to Amazon and buy one for somebody else and gift it, pay it forward to somebody that you know could benefit from learning the tools that you learned in the book. And the second is if and only if you really want to and you believe there was value there, please leave a legal review. And if it's a four or five stars, thank you very much. If it's not and it's a one star, I want you to leave that too. I'm not a, a writer. I'm just trying to get my message out to more people. And frankly, out of 275,000 people that have watched a video I put on YouTube about almost 10 years ago, I have at least 25 who rag on me, get angry with me. I have this 30-minute this video out there, how to pitch to investors in under two minutes with no slides. At least 25 people have written to me and says, oh, if it took you 25 minutes to explain how to pitch in two, this has got to be a bunch of you know what. What can you do? There's always the naysayers out there. But thank you so much for having me on your show. Nathan, how can people out home, at home find out more about you? I've been around the Internet since 1994. So I think Google probably would know me if all they did was put in Nathan Gold. I have NathanGold.com. Nathan.gold works, too. <laughs> and... One piece of advice you'd give to an entrepreneur out there. One piece of it, uh, it's very simple. Forget everything everybody's telling you about rubrics and seven slides and 13 slides. Forget all about that. And just let people see who you really are. Show them your authentic, enthusiastic self. And you'll probably get further down the road faster. Nathan, this was amazing information. Thank you. I saw the passion in your voice. I love the story of the entrepreneur you helped on TED Talk. And I know that everyone at home, when they go to NathanGold.com or Nathan.Gold and find out more information about you, they'll be amazed at everything you've done. And everyone at home, please get a copy of his book coming out May 23rd. And we want to welcome everyone to see next week's episode, where we interview Jeff Foss, who is a certified valuation expert. And he'll be talking about the subtleties, the art of determining the valuation for a company. See you next week. Thank you from all of us at Silicon Valley Successes. We hope you found the information presented today useful in your path to success. For further information on accessing the resources in Silicon Valley, you may visit us on the web at SiliconValleySuccesses.com, on Facebook, and YouTube. Thank you. And remember, we want to help you in your journey to become the next success.